morning. How's everyone doing? Good. A couple of caveats before I begin. One is I have my first cold of the season, so if I'm coughing and sputtering up here, I apologize, and I will soldier through it, pun intended. Uh, best I can. See? Get that? All right. Um, also, second is, there are questions. You know, part of what we want to talk about is some of the things we do know. Part of what I'd like to do today is also open up some questions about things I don't know, and if Cordelia were here, we can maybe ask her, and Hopefully she'll watch this video and, and get to work on those questions. But I think part of what we want to think about is, you know, some of the issues we don't know. How did the church respond? How did our church respond to certain issues? Some of these things we have a sense of, others we don't. And I'm going to offer up some speculation, too. Um, it's a little bit more grounded in history the best we can. So let me begin with, can everyone hear me okay? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to start, actually, with just a... You know me, I have to do some sort of activity to get us going here. And I'm going to think about the, the wars that the United States fought in in the 20th and 21st centuries. And if we think about them, we've got World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the First Gulf War, and um, the war in Afghanistan, and the Second Gulf War. And if we look at this list, and we were to rank it in order of most popular to least popular, in terms of public support, think about that for a moment, if you will. <clears throat> what are our candidates for least popular? Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay, is there anybody who would say something other than Vietnam? <clears throat> I think maybe the only one you could maybe say is the second Gulf War, which quickly soured, right, in, in a way. Because Vietnam was actually fairly popular for a time, and then the wheels sort of came off the bus, as it were. But, okay, so we know that that one, if we were to say, what's the most popular war, in terms of public support? World War II. Is there another answer besides World War II? It's, I mean, we have maybe, so one possibility here of World War I, but near unanimous sense that World War II is the most popular, and I think... In many ways, I think historians would say, that's right, right? As we look back at the record and we see, yeah, some of these other wars were, World War I had a fair amount of support, but there was some dissension. There were people thrown in jail for making anti-war speeches, and uh, Korea certainly was a little bit confusing to people as to why it was being fought in Vietnam. Anyway, so we could go on and on here. But World War II is a war that generally considered to be the most popular war in American history, the one that unites the most people and, and brings the most people together. And, Again, I think that's right, and that's true. And one of the big themes I want to talk about with St. James and their connections to the war is that sense of unity and a sense of which this war did pull people together and inspire people um, in, in ways that are probably not surprising, but it's interesting to see the specific manifestations of that. Um, so, why is World War II so popular? Yeah. One, we are attacked, right? Okay, so that there's the uniting factor of... The attack in Pearl Harbor that inspires people. Why else is World War II so popular? Yeah. I think there were 7 million service people. How many million of people in the service in World War II? I don't know off the top of my head. But you need just the idea that there's so many people involved and that it connects to people in that way. And certainly that is the, uh, the biggest war in terms of U.S. involvement. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Yeah very clear enemy or villain to fight with. What makes that villain so clear? Hitler, or, well, he's the leader of a genocide. A genocidal regime, right? Yeah. So the, right, that's what we're getting, right? So there's an ideological reason as well yeah. for why this is the case, right? And I, and I yeah. So. Um, we were fighting with our allies. We were we supported allies, countries we have connections with, in particular Great Britain, right? All of those add up, and I think they make, yeah, just go ahead. Everybody knew somebody in the war then. And then that comes back to Bob's point, right? That there's so yeah. many people who were involved that, that there's a deep sense of connection. Yeah, every neighborhood had somebody who was serving. And we had victory gardens, and we had Sam's, and we had, everybody was involved. So lots, and that's, again, that's part of what I want to talk about. It's the way in which everybody gets involved, in which people participate in a whole host of ways. One last thought on this, because then I want to move on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, Japan triggered our entrance right into the World War, so we had a two-front war to uh, fight. What's interesting, we the industry, didn't the industry, like, triple, like, into production of 
materials for the Absol Absolutely, right? There's an economic factor here. So if we think about it, we do have a two-front war, and we have compelling reasons on both fronts. One is we get attacked by the Japanese, which, of course, inspires sort of immediate response. The other front is Nazi Germany-led, and it is a hateful regime that has all the wrong politics, and, and that um, is, of course, part of what explains this. And we think about Hitler and the ideology of Hitler. That certainly is something that, again, uh, inspires people. He beca becomes a sort of target and enemy that people can focus on. However, I do want to mention there's a couple of things that are worth thinking about here. Adolf Hitler was not as unpopular then as we think about him being now. Um, and that's you know, something to keep in mind. And, and, and the Episcopal Church, to its credit, globally, was pretty anti-Hitler pretty early on. But they were pretty anti-Hitler because of the discrimination against Christians. Um, and and you know, the idea of Hitler sort of being targeting Lutheran Germans and you know, things of that sort, that inspired the Episcopal Church to it wasn't necessarily the treatment of the Jews um, or the, the rhetoric. I mean, Hitler hated a lot of people, right? He had lots of rhetoric against people of color of various kinds. And, you know, so, so we got to think of, there is a little bit of complexity here that, um, and a sign of that complexity, we often think about the story of Jesse Owens. I tend to do sports history, so I got to bring in sports <laughs> history, right? So Jesse Owens, we often remember that story of Jesse Owens going and winning all those gold medals and proving Aryan superiority wrong and all that stuff. A few months after Jesse Owens wins that Olympic, uh, all those medals in the Olympics, Avery Brundage, who was the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee at the time, praised Hitler at a rally in New York because he thought he ran a real tight ship and had things under control and was keeping all the, the sort of wrong people out of power, right? So there's a, there's a kind of ugly, uh, an ugliness. And Avery Brundage, by the way, I don't like to editorialize. I don't like to talk about like, we should be empathetic of people's beliefs, but Avery Brunner's is the worst. I mean, he just, he's always on the wrong side of things. Anyway, so, um, but yeah, so we do have this ideological uh, enemy, and, and it's a clear one, but again, it's a little bit more complicated. Again, if you want to find some hope, though, by the mid, by 1942, 1943, the Episcopal Church globally is calling attention to the treatment of Jews, and is in a way that, say, the British government isn't even really responding to. The Episcopal Church is trying to get its leaders to recognize the sort of real uh, horrendous things that are going on with Jewish people. So that is, uh, you know, a little bit something different. Yeah? Actually, didn't Germany then declare war on us? That made things a little bit easier. Oh. oh, that's true. Yeah, well, right. Germany did declare war on us first. That's right, because we declared war on Japan. They were allies, and then that sort of uh, led into it. Um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, here you see actual an image from the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's wild to think that we have this sort of photographic evidence of it that, of course, does unite people. Um, and just to give you a sense of that unity here, um, note here on the vote to declare war against Japan, 82 to nothing in the Senate and uh, 388 to 1 uh, in, in terms of the declaration of war. We will never see a war, de first of all, we never see war declarations anyway, but if we were to actually ask Congress to declare war, we'd never see those kind of numbers. Again, it is astonishing that degree of unity. And the one objection um, uh, was, uh, I forget her first name, but she was a... Jeanette. Jeanette, okay, she's a pacifist. Um, so she was against, you know, war altogether. So she voted her conscience uh, and, and, you know, so anyway. Um, so, so we're right, and, and all of these reasons make <clears throat> World War II popular. I forget who it was. Was Czech? He said the economy, right? Uh, as booming here. So, yeah. yeah. And if we take a look at the, the the unemployment in the United States, remember we're coming out of the Great Depression. The unemployment rate is about 15 in 1940, as war breaks out in Europe. Um, by the time we get to 1944, the unemployment rate is under 2%. So that also makes the war popular in some ways. I mean, it brings the economy back up and running. Um, and as a number of people have observed, lots of people get involved in lots of different ways in the war. So um, <clears throat> rationing connects people to the war. They, uh, they feel a sense of connection. And, and actually, <clears throat> excuse me again, some of what um, I think is interesting here is that a lot of the rationing that was done was technically sort of unnecessary. Um, you know, that they really had enough materials, enough supplies, but in some ways they did this rationing precisely because it got people invested in the war. It made them connected in a way that uh, sort of kept up their involvement. Um, so this is, uh, you know, 
you all I'm sure remember stories. Of, this is where margarine essentially is invented to take the place of butter and women drawing on lines for stockings and, because they didn't actually have stockings and you know things of that sort. So um, kind of fun details like that. Um, people are invested in terms of buying war bonds. Some of those war bond ads can be pretty innocuous and um, uh, you know this is an actual war bond ad here. Some of them are a little terrifying, I think. Um, you know, using that sense of fear, and again, that sense of the ideological enemy to, to motivate people in pretty interesting ways. Um, so where does that leave us? How does St. James get involved? What are some of the ways in which we can see this unity, that involvement, that investment in our own parish? Um, and I think there are a number of uh, things that start uh, service on the home front, thinking about those ways in which people here in their everyday lives are trying to get involved in World War II. And by the way, I am skipping, you know, like all the details of the Ger Germans invading the Rhineland and all that sort of stuff. If you're interested, I'm glad to talk about it. But I felt like we should focus on St. James. So you can ask questions about any of that, those sort of more technical stuff. I'd be glad to do my best. Um, so how did St. James get involved? One of the main things they did um, and were, were sort of celebrated for was blood drives in this very building, the parish house. Um, the Red Cross held a number of blood drives here. And this is the site of um, frequent ones, and, and they sort of got special certificates uh, recognizing that. We also have, and this connects to our exhibit, all of you have gone to see the exhibit at Lancaster History already, but if you haven't, um, we have the foundation of a service club, and this was formed by the women uh, of St. James, women who had um, uh, potentially <coughs> family members serving abroad or not. Um, but these were women who organized letters and gifts to soldiers abroad. Um, and some of those examples of letters are in the exhibit. And um, there is actually a, a whole volume of them, um, which is somewhere, well, I guess it's in the history, history now. It used to be in the basement. You know, but it, it's in the history now, so thankfully. Uh, but you can actually go flip through. You know, Cordelia pulled out a couple of them, and I found them to be sort of fascinating and poignant, um, especially noting uh, their thank you letters from soldiers in terms of receiving these gifts. And I thought the one who writes something like addresses it somewhere in New Guinea or something like that, right? You know, just, and I just thought about this sort of bewildered 22 year old across the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then that sense of sort of a destabilized life. And, and anyway, so I think it's, you know, fascinating stuff there. So the parish gets involved on the home front, that sort of investment, civic investment. Uh, in a couple different ways. We had an air raid warden here at St. James, um, and funny little anecdote from the official parish uh, history that uh, at a service in December of 1942, they sounded the air raid alarm, and everyone marched out and came across into the parish house from the church. Um, so that was just a drill, but uh, so we did have an air, air raid warden here, so that sense, again, of people you know, really getting involved, obviously the likelihood that Lancaster, Pennsylvania was going to be bombed. Uh, <laughs> very small. Anyway, but, but to be prepared in that sense of getting people invested and involved, I think, was a, a big part of these activities. Um, and just some images here to show that. There's a photograph of the, the meeting of the service club, club from the rectory garden. You can see it's the vast majority of people there are uh, women. Uh, and this is the actual tech the cover of that book that has the letters uh, from servicemen that have been collected. Um, so, uh, I just think a kind of fun thing to see. How else did we get involved here? Well, of course, parishioners served in the war. And as Bob noted and, and Judson noted, everybody knew somebody, uh, it seemed like, who was serving in the war. And, and obviously, we'll get through everybody who served in the war from the parish. But um, People like Nevin Rents, who was a Marine, served in the Guadalcanal campaign. And I do have a map I can pull up so we can take a look at where some of this stuff is. We're not familiar. Um, Robert Gelhard, who was also in the, was in the Navy. Uh, so we have a Marine and we have a Navy uh, a sailor who was also in that campaign, was wounded and sent back to the US. This is in the, obviously the Pacific Theater. Uh, a bombardier in the South Pacific, Paul Souder. Uh, and Thomas Franklin Bosman Jr., Tommy, who was the first St. James parishioner to die in either of the world wars, um, and was uh, 
killed in March 1944 in the Pacific at the age of 22. Um, and it's astonishing to think that that he was the first St. James parishioner in either World War One or World War Two that late in 1944. Um, but uh, a sign of the sort of you know human sacrifice, right? The individuals here who served in the war and the, and the price paid for it. Um, and Christian Martin Jr., parishioner who uh, landed on the beaches at Normandy, the D-Day landings on June 6, 1944, uh, and was wounded. In that, he had returned to duty nine weeks later and served out the rest of the war. So um, just, a, again, a scattering, a handful of some of the people who actually served in the military. But we can see these people who serve both the Pacific uh, theater and the European theater, um, people who are injured, killed even, um, and, and deeply involved. And this is the service flag. So the, uh, this was on the Orange Street entrance here, flag which had a star for everyone who was, so the number of stars would change depending on the number of people who were serving in the military. Um, we can see this is in 1942. And that's why it's asymmetrical at the top there. So you've got space for two more, two more stars to be added in. This is uh, probably some of you have seen at the exhibit, but this is a telegram um, to uh, the rector at the time, um, sort of prepping for the invasion of Europe for the D-Day landings. I think it's a pretty remarkable telegram, uh, a neat thing to have uh, to um, pray for the armed forces and all those who minister to their needs. Um, and this is April of 1944, April 22nd, so it's before the June landings. In fact, the D-Day landings were pushed back at least once, and I, I don't remember off the top of my head how many times, mostly because of weather issues. Um, they had to you know, make sure the weather was right for it. So I I, my assumption is that this telegram came before one of the earliest plans to do it, uh, and then when the, the, the assault was pushed back. Um, after that fact. So you get a sense here that the church is very much you know, asked to be involved, asked to be involved in terms of prayer and support, uh, moral and spiritual support for uh, the armed forces. And uh, the landings in Normandy, um, <clears throat> just a, a map here of the D-Day landings. You can see the two US, uh, the two US divisions here at Utah and Omaha Beach. Um, so down here, uh, the two U.S. and we have British and Canadian uh, forces elsewhere. Many of you have probably seen um, Saving Private Ryan or some such thing uh, that depicts this. If you haven't seen Saving Private Ryan, I think it's worth watching for the first 15 minutes alone, um, just to give you some of the, the horror of war and, and these landings. It's really well done. Um, so again, we have a St. James prisoner riding in one of these amphibious uh, vehicles to the beach. It's, it's really remarkable to think about. Um, of course, locally, too, how many of you have ever seen Band of Brothers, the HBO series? So the main, I'm probably familiar, but the main character in the Band of Brothers series, Dick Winters, was a Lancaster, was an F&M graduate. Um, so another sort of local connection. Not a St. Jameser, but uh, you know, still that local connection here um, in, that, in that series. <clears throat> Um, if we look again, just to give you a sense of geography here, I think it's worth thinking about place and where people are. Um, the uh, Guadalcanal here, Guadalcanal is on the bottom right of our map. So those soldiers who fought in Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands campaign. Um, this is the Japanese Empire in 1942 at its peak, as it expands to the biggest uh, biggest level it would get, um, and. Uh, the first sort of stopping of that is the Battle of the Coral Sea, which took place down in here. And then, of course, the Battle of Midway, which I have Midway on this map. But the Battle of Midway, which took place, and of course, just been made into a movie. Uh, I have not seen. It's not supposed to be very good. But uh, in any event, um, the Battle of Midway, which would turn the tide uh, in uh, the Pacific Theater. And this is an image from the Battle of Midway. Again, wild to think we have these these images uh, of the conflict. Um, to give you a sense of that chaos and the, uh, the horror of war, and to imagine our own you know, fellow parishioners. Let's think about prayer. 
Because um, another thing, again, that churches are involved in is prayer and involved in the war. In that way, what did St. James do as far as prayer goes? Um, I thought this was a nice little bit of uh, information um, about the prayer that was given on the D-Day landings, that this nation might always stand for the hard right as against the easy wrong, that our men might fight the good fight for right and life, or if need be like the Son of God in death, and that God, in the way his wisdom sees best, might preside over the destiny of the nation with divine grace. So the day of the D-Day landings, um, prayer was conducted all day uh, in the church, um, at noon and 6 p.m., there were special services led by the rector. So, um, you know, people very much connected, very much plugged in, knowing the risk and, and the, the, the horrors that awaited. And I, somebody more knowledgeable than me, I can't quite remember. How many times has the English Channel ever been crossed for an invasion purposes? D-Day was either the second or third time this had happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a, ten, yeah, right, the Norman, the Norman conqueror, right, and it hadn't been done since then, and there was a lot of anxiety precisely because of that. You have to travel over huge swaths of water, and and you know, so there, you get a sense of the anxiety here, um, and and also, the, you know, that's people were so plugged in knew what was at stake. Yeah. When did the public know? When was there an announcement that the invasion had occurred or was in progress? That we would have been praying on the same day. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, um, I think Eisenhower had a message uh, broadcast shortly after they set forth. Or, well, I don't know. I think they were landing when they were landing. Oh, Eisenhower did make an announcement, and then I'm trying to remember, you know, FDR. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know off the top. Right. We do get the communication from Eisenhower that says on this day. And asked to ask for prayer as well, um, and so that must have been communicated relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, five hours. Yeah, the fire was right after the fire started. The fire started. So, so one and two and one and no. By radio or by uh, uh, television. Mm. So, um, mm. we'll jump ahead and, and just a couple more things to spotlight here because. Some of this will get into speculative stuff, but also, I think, uh, in interesting ways. I want to call attention to some issues we may not be as familiar with. Um, one is, in February 1945, we had an interracial service with the African the AME Church. And I'm not sure which one it was. I assume it's, what is it? Bethel. Bethel. Yeah, I was going to say Bethel. I assume it was Bethel, but uh, didn't, sorry, didn't see that in the actual name. But um, so we have an interracial prayer service in February 1945, um, where the sermon is delivered by an African American man, um, a chaplain, which I thought was a pretty interesting moment here, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, in the wake of, of other events in the war, there was a prayer service for the death of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He dies, of course, just prior to war's end. Um, we had services to commemorate both victories in Europe and victory in Japan. Um, and after the war, the vestry agreed to donate $5,000, which is big money in those days, uh, to help uh, restore Episcopal churches across the world that had been damaged in the conflict. So that sense of investment and involvement there. Um, and there was also, in between, after the victory over Japan, there was what we would call an ecumenical service at McCaskey High School, where a number of the um, parishes in the town got together for a kind of peace service, as it were sort of a service to dedicate to world peace and a sort of uh, peaceful future. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, as I said, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that interracial service because I don't know why they held it. Um, and, I, you know, I, and I tried to do some research to figure out if I could find more backstory or you know, if there was a specific issue. Um, and I, I couldn't. But um, it's... An interesting and a positive moment, I think, for St. James to be doing this in 1945. And um, there's a bunch of backstory that could, you know, that I think is worth thinking about and maybe help explain why they did it. Um, and, and I'm just going to speculate as to, you know, some of those things. Um, anyone know who this guy is? No, it does look like Bayard Rustin. That's a good, yeah, no, this is A. Philip Randolph, who, um, yeah, I was an African American labor leader, and um, he was one of the 
key uh, African American civil rights leaders in the 1930s and 1940s. And one of the things that Randolph did was, as the economy started to take off in World, World War II, before the U.S. is actually involved in the war, the economy is picking up, the U.S. is building stuff, sending stuff to allies. Randolph was a labor leader, the sleeping car porters, and was frustrated because African Americans were systematically being discriminated against and getting employment as the economy was picking up. And his, he proposed a march on Washington, tens of thousands of people, to protest discrimination and said, how great would it be if we had a monster demonstration in front of the Lincoln Memorial to protest the fact that African Americans aren't getting employment? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was trying to rally you know, American unity, American support. He knows the U.S. is going to get involved in the war. He does not want a big protest march in Washington, D.C. And so he, uh, as a result, passes in the spring of, uh, or I guess summer uh, of 1941, Executive Order 8802, which um, established the FEPC and said that there would be no discrimination in employment of uh, workers in the defense industries or government because of race, creed, color, et cetera. This is a direct response to A. Philip Randolph's threat. Randolph agrees, he pulls back, there will be no march. Randolph will finally get his march. He is the lead organizer and planner of the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, so he does you know, eventually do that, but in the moment he pulls back. And I, I mention this because it's part of a subtext of, you know, there are, as much as World War II is about unity, there are still divisions. And, and race is one of those divisions in American life. And um, just to give you a sense of this, and I'm going to open it up for questions in, in just a minute or two. Um, just some of the stuff, in terms of race, race, quote unquote, riots break out at different points during the war. Um, the Zoot Suit Riots, have you heard of the Zoot Suit Riots? The Zoot Suit Riots took place in Southern California, often involved actually uh, Hispanic uh, American youth in particular, although African Americans were drawn into it as well, um, in which to make a long story short, essentially, white servicemen, in particular white servicemen who come from southern states and who are now stationed in Southern California, went on a rampage and just attacked any kind of young person of color wearing a zoot suit. Um, and a zoot suit was a, you know what a zoot suit was? Big shoulders, long coats, and it was very much part of the sort of swing era. Think of Cab Calloway from back in the day, right? So that sort of outfit, big hat, and um, the zoot suits were adopted primarily by African American youth and uh, Hispanic American youth. And they were also controversial because they seemed to defy rationing, because they used so much fabric to wear, you know? So there was a sense of this was rebellion in style, but it was also rebellion in terms of rationing. And so, anyway, that's just one, this, this sort of. <coughs> The bigger problem with the Zoot Suit Riots was that I think a lot of these white Southern people thought that these, you know, colored kids were getting up it and needed to be sort of put back in their place. And it's a, it's a brutal uh, set of days. Um, the Port Ch Chicago disaster in July 1944, um, African American soldiers, African Americans participate in World War II. Um, but note the military is segregated for the duration of World War II. And not only is it segregated, but black troops are disproportionately put into menial, second-class sort of positions in the war. Now, there are exceptions. We get the Tuskegee Airmen, for example, and um, in the Battle of the Bulge, um, <clears throat> black troops are pressed into duty and in active duty in ways that they previously had been denied. But by and large, African Americans are relegated to these sort of secondary supporting roles. In the Port Chicago disaster, African American uh, soldiers were loading ammunition onto ships, and they were pressured to load faster than was safe. And there was an explosion, and about 250 soldiers were killed, and African American soldiers were killed. A little while later, a similar set, you know, African American troops are asked to do the same thing. They refused to do so because of what happened at this. At this uh, the Port Chicago disaster is in Northern California. Um, and they are essentially convicted of mutiny for refusing to do it, right? So there are these tensions that involving race here. So all of that is backdrop for thinking about the fact that St. James has an interracial.